Okay, so welcome along everyone. This is uh, In Conservation With. Uh, my name is David Lindo, also known as The Urban Birder. And today, tonight, oh by the way, before I even start, I must say that tonight is uh, sponsored by Leica Sport Optics. And I'm sorry, I've got all sorts of stuff going on outside. I'm in Spain um, and it's quite warm here. It's about probably late 20s and there's dogs and kids outside. You know, so please excuse any shouting of dogs or kids barking. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, I'd like to introduce to you tonight, uh, this afternoon and this morning, Tim Beatley. Now, Tim, you better introduce yourself because I actually yeah, met, I, I actually sort of knew about you literally a week or two ago. I saw your, I saw your, um, I saw your book on, on Twitter. And by the way, have you got a copy of your book? Can you just quickly show us your book? I, I can, which came out uh, last year, folks. I can wave it around. Here it is. And I actually have a slide or two that has the cover on it too, a little bit later. Okay. In the but there it is. Great. The Bird Friendly City. It's a island press book. Good. Now, Tim, I know absolutely next to nothing about you. This is like a blind sure. This is a blind date. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So give me the elevator pitch, please. Okay. Uh, sure. Well, hello, everybody. It's great, great to see you. Great to be with you, sort of, in this Zoom world we're in. Um, so, oh, yes, Tim, Tim Beatley. I'm, uh, I'm actually sitting in my office in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia in the U.S. So I'm in a city called Charlottesville, just uh, about 100 miles south of Washington, D.C., um, and I teach in an urban planning department. I'm an urban planner by, by training. And so a lot of my work over the years has been about nature, nature in cities and how we incorporate nature into cities. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, uh, that broader work and, and tell you a little bit about this concept of a biophilic city, a natureful city. Um, and birds are, are uh, a big part of that as well. But um, I don't think, David, I could call myself, uh, I, I am an, ur an urbanist. Um, I like to say that I'm, I'm, I don't really think I can claim to be a birder, but I have been a, a, a lifelong bird lover. And uh, birds are very, have been very important to me and a very important part of uh, what makes life you know, interesting and, and wonderful. And, 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 and increasingly in cities. So, so that's the short, the short story. I'm teaching here, um, gosh, about 30 years now. And uh, so we have a, a, um, a, an urban planning program in a, in a school of architecture. So we're very much about it's architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, urban planning, all about sort of how do you, how do you design the uh, spaces and buildings and, and uh, ur urban environments. Yeah, I mean, you, you describe yourself as not being a birder, but a bird lover. To me, there's no real difference. No, um, distinction. You know, because at the end of the day, yeah. as long as you can appreciate nature, that's all that matters. Now, I haven't unfortunately got your book. Um, as you will get it hopefully soon. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to because that's one book I definitely want on my shelf. Because it's not it's not the same having a PDF, especially when you've been looking at computer screens all day long, and then looking at another, you know, looking at something else on a computer screen is a bit much. Right. But um, no, I, I, I was really excited when I, I saw your book and I've managed to read the first few pages of the book. And I noticed that even though you say you're not a birder, <laughs> you actually kind of was brought up with birds around you, weren't you? I mean, your mother was a keen birder. That's right. My, my mother uh, was very, she was, I don't think she'd call herself a birder either, but she, she very much loved seeing birds, hearing birds. Uh, so from an early age, that's something I was aware of, absorbed uh, from, from her. I, I grew up in a, in a city called Alexandria, which is uh, an old, old for us, us anyway, an old city just across the Potomac River from Washington. Um, and I lived in a, in, a, in a house that was surrounded by a forest in, in the middle of a city. So I had a lot of nature around me and I was able to spend a lot of time outside. And so, uh, so I had, yeah, the sights and sounds of birds uh, around me from a very early age. Well, that's good. I mean, I think, you know, I personally had a similar sort of upbringing in that I wasn't, apart from the fact I wasn't on an island or, you know, in an island area kind of thing, I was in the middle of the city, but, mm. you know, birds were a very early influence on me. And it's really refreshing to meet someone who's developed individually, you know, separately, 
and also has that love, even though he doesn't call himself a birder like you. <laughs> you don't call yourself a birder. Yeah. And I love the fact that, you know, you're a town planner because, you know, for years I've been lamenting the lack of imagination in terms of, yeah. you know, the, late, the latest, you know, architecture and, and, and right. housing estates and projects that are built, which are just a sea of grey yeah. glass. And right. I've noticed in the very, very few, very recent years that um, there's been a bit of a turn in the tide, as far as I can see, because I've, I've even worked with one, and they call themselves the master developer, but they buy the whole kind of area. And then when they sell it on to a developer, they say, you can have it, but you need to keep this yeah. forest or keep this lake. And I think that's a great thing. And I mean, obviously we can talk more about it, especially once we've seen you know what you've got to tell us about but right. do you do you i mean without sort of uh, without giving us a spoiler alert do you think that the tide is changing do you think that things are people are beginning to cop yes. to this whole idea of cities that are, are, are friendly for nature yeah, yeah I, I think so de definitely and and you'll see that we've started a, a global network of cities uh, and it is gaining traction and the idea of a natureful city or a biophilic city is, is really uh, is gaining traction. And, and the pandemic is a interesting thing to, to, to think about because uh, for many of us who have been in lockdown or been, been having to deal with that, uh, nature has been this thing, the saving grace for us, this, this balm, this, uh, this thing, this element of, of, of uh, normalcy in, a, in an otherwise topsy-turvy Kind of world, so I think now especially we have uh, this greater appreciation or reappreciation, if you will, of how important nature is in our lives, and uh, and birds are a big a big part of that. We we know in the U.S. Uh, we've seen all these uh, all these indicators that people are paying more attention to nature, and birds especially. So if you look at the traffic to bird sites and downloads of bird apps and and you know people buying bird feeders and bird bird seed and so on all, all going way up and and i've heard so many people tell me that they uh they've started watching birds started listening to birds never done it before but the the, the stress and and uh you know the challenge of, of being in the pandemic has has um and literally hatched a lot of new birders i think yeah, it, yeah, I, to I totally agree with you. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a wonderful thing, and it's interesting. Earlier today, I I, I was on a podcast um, being interviewed by the World Wild the World Wildlife Fund, mm. and uh, one of the sort of the key sort of overarching subject was re rewilding, and yeah, it's funny that when you talk about rewilding, people have this thing thought in their head about all the sexy species. I mean, in the UK, for example, it's about, could we get the wolf back? What about mm -hmm. the bear? What about the, the, the European lynx? Um, but for me, it's more than that. Rewilding starts on your doorstep. And if you can, if you've got a garden, just have one square foot or one square meter just left to nature, that's a a huge expanse of jungle for a beetle or an ant, you know, right. and that's how we need to start thinking about things. We need to think about it, you know, really localized, something right. we can do that can make a change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. And there's so many ways that we can do pretty relatively easy ways that we can be planting native species of things, introducing some water, doing some things that really uh, could profoundly change the, the the spaces around us and convert them to, you know, habitat. That's rather than just turf grass lawn. Yeah. Well, listen, let's, let's, let's see okay. what you talk to us Here about. we go. Then, then we can have a bit more direction in terms of, you know, Great. Who you are at. David, I've, I've warned you that I have a lot of slides. I'll warn the group. And so I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, at some point, I'm going to probably run out of time. But uh, so we'll just kind of go quickly through the last slides. But David, do you feel... Feel free to stop me if I'm going too long. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I will because I know Maya will pull the plug straight away once you're over time. So you be careful. Okay. Um, so hopefully, can everybody see this uh, this biophilic cities um, page? Yeah. And also, just to okay, sorry to interrupt you, but for those Zoomers um, who are new to this, 
if you put yourself on speaker view or you change your your setting to speaker view then you'll get the whole presentation as opposed to a whole lot of faces sorry tim okay no that's great all right so what i'm going to do is uh tell you a little bit about this broader idea of biophilic cities which uh is a is another way of saying um cities of nature essentially and um, then the second part will be specifically about birds and this concept of a bird friendly city. So I am an urban planner and a lot of my work uh, is focused on designing uh, cities. We argue for more compact and dense cities as we cities are, are facing the daunting challenges of, of climate change, adapting to climate change, hopefully profoundly reducing their carbon uh, footprints. Uh, pretty quickly, uh, cities need to be much more um, walkable and, and bi bikeable, and, and we need to be investing in things like transit and, and, and transitioning to renewable energy. So many things that cities need to be doing. So density and compactness are good, um, but the question arises, can you have nature uh, when you have that density and compactness? And, and so a lot of our work is focused on answering that question. Here it's a question mark, take that question mark away. We believe, we, we argue that you have to have that nature uh, in cities. And so um, about a decade ago, we started something here at UVA called the Biophilic Cities Project, building on this idea of biophilia. Here's a definition uh, from E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard. He wasn't the first person to use the word biophilia, but he's really the one who's coined it in the way that we think of it today, which means this this innate um, connection to nature, this innate affiliation to nature, that to lead uh, happy and healthy and truly meaningful lives, we have to have nature all around us where we're living and where we're spending most of our time. It can't be something that you get once or twice a year on a holiday. It has to be integrated into the spaces where we spend most of our time. And increasingly that's uh, cities. A lot of evidence, a lot of uh, emerging evidence about the power of nature, we could spend the whole um, hour talking just about that evidence almost every week. There's something new. Um, and these are slides, this is a slide just to kind of make the point that for a lot of us, it's very intuitive. When we think about what it is that gives us pleasure and delight in the world, it is these things. It is living things, flowers and trees and butterflies and, and, and birds. Uh, but there is a lot of evidence, um, increasing evidence. And here's just, just a few uh, slides that give you a little bit of a sense of that evidence. An article, a study published in Bioscience uh, showing the relationship between uh, nature, trees and birds and nature. Um, and when you have those things, um, lower levels of reported depression, anxiety and, uh, and stress. Um, we know all of this wonderful work coming out of Japan around the concept of forest bathing that uh, the Japanese show pretty definitively that as you, as you at the end of a walk uh, through the woods, at the end of that walk, your stress hormone levels have gone down, that that walk gives you a boost to your immune system um, and not a big surprise maybe. And it, it, the Japanese are so convinced that they've established a network of forest bathing uh, stations. So there is an, an emerging science around biophilia. We don't entirely understand why it is that nature uh, makes us feel so much better. Um, there is a lot of work around the idea of fractals. Um, these are self-repeating shapes and forms in nature so that um, that leaf is a small version of the bow, which is a smaller version of the tree. Um, and and the, the theory that uh, the human species has co-evolved with nature and that we have uh, we developed a visual system that effort, effortlessly processes these fractals. Um, and uh, here's a quote from uh, Richard Taylor. We've gotten to know Richard. He's the chair of the physics department at the University of Oregon, and, he, and he's done a lot of the leading uh, research around fractals. And it turns out, by the way, that uh, birds have lots of fractals in, in their feather patterns and their uh, shapes and then actually in the flight patterns of, of birds even. Um, the image on the left is actually from the UK, a really interesting uh, use of bird song uh, as a way of detecting hearing loss, really interesting. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, evidence about the power of bird song and, and uh, the therapeutic value, the, 
fact that some hospitals are recording birdsong, playing it back at particularly stressful times um, when kids are going into surgeries or, or being inoculated. I'll, I'll circle back to birdsong because that's really important. So there is all of this evidence about the power of nature and all, all of the things that you see on the right side of this slide are uh, things that are coming out of this research and this evidence. And it's, it's uh, public health and medicine and, and uh, uh, environmental psychology. Again, in the presence of nature, we see lower levels of depression and anxiety, lower levels of stress, improved mood, uh, increased physical activity. We know the, the greener and more natureful the neighborhood is, the more likely we're going to be out there walking and thus uh, healthier. Um, in the US, we have a lot of evidence that crime goes down when you have more nature, gun violence goes down, um, even evidence coming out of environmental psychology that in the presence of nature, we are more likely to be generous, more likely to be cooperative, more likely to think creatively. And you could say more likely to be better human beings when we have nature uh, all around us. So uh, for us trying to summarize it in the biophilic cities movement, we often use the word flourishing. And flourishing for me, it's, it's a wonderful word because it's not just about uh, pleasure and benefit, it's also about uh, meaning and purpose and sort of deeper connections to, to the natural world and to each other. Um, we know that nature in cities does many things for us. There are lots of ecological services provided by, by nature. This is another important reason to be talking about this idea of biophilic cities. This is an, uh, these are images from Rotterdam in the Netherlands uh, where they're thinking a lot about water. So uh, investing in green rooftops, for example, more nature, but also a way of retaining uh, water. And the image from the second to the left is this wonderful idea of a, a water plaza or a water square that's designed to create new gathering spaces, uh, new places for, for people uh, in neighborhoods that need it, but also uh, designed to collect and retain uh, stormwater, rainwater. So um, just about anything that you can do to make a city more natureful will also make it more uh, resilient. So I've already kind of made this point in the few remarks to, to David in the beginning, but uh, we're trying to collect a lot of the stories of cities, how cities have been adapting uh, in real time to the pandemic. And I do think that uh, the pandemic has shaped uh, and will continue to shape our perceptions of, of nature. So these are two uh, part, images from two partner cities in our biophilic cities uh, network, uh, Portland, Oregon on the left, Edmonton, Canada on the right. On the, on the left is a, is a park called Forest Park. It's a big park in Portland. And during the lockdown, um, they have seen unprecedented um, demand to, to visit this park. And so like a lot of cities, they have in real time been, been adapting. So they've um, they created this sort of one way um, movement pattern through the park as a way of maximizing the number of people who can enjoy it. And um, so, and you've, in many cities, of course, these are images from San Francisco, another one of our partner cities. Uh, a lot of cities have been closing streets, of course, in San Francisco, they created a whole network of slow streets uh, many of these streets will remain closed, I think, as, as the pandemic hopefully ends. Um, but I think that we have uh, seen this resurgence, this renewed appreciation for what nature can do for us. So this idea of biophilic and, and cities, um, it, it manifests and applies in lots of of, of ways and at lots of different scales. There is a, a huge amount of work uh, taking place around biophilic design, um, which tends to be at the scale of buildings. And so this is a, a new building in Toronto. Toronto is another one of our partner cities. Uh, several hundred trees incorporated into this uh, vertical tower, a really interesting story. So biophilic buildings uh, bring nature in, into the interior of, of those spaces. This is another example of a wonderful biophilic building uh, called the um, Center for Sustainable Landscapes at the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh. I'm sorry, I have a lot of uh, um, American and North American uh, examples. Um, by the way, if I forget to say this, we have a web page. Uh, it's, it's biophiliccities.org, which is the page, the site of our Biophilic Cities uh, network. Um, and a lot of the materials I'm showing you 
uh, you can find there. And there's even a bird friendly city page there. But one of the things that we do is tell wonderful stories of what uh, cities are doing, the innovations, the design and planning innovations, incorporating nature. We do it through uh, films, short films. So we've discovered the sort of five to seven minute film is uh, a, a really powerful way of telling that story. So I've got a number of slides where it says, watch the film. So this biophilic building, you see this wonderful public green rooftop and um, the natural daylight and the emphasis on native vegetation. There is a short five or seven minute film about this uh, building on our webpage. And I would, I would love for you to visit the, the webpage and, and watch a few of those films. So we say that a biophilic city is certainly a city with lots of biophilic buildings, but it's really more holistic than that. It's, it's hard to say, thinking of the entire city as an ecosystem, which it is. Um, so biophilic cities are cities that emphasize that connection to nature and helping residents to connect to the nature all around them. Again, it's, it's certainly designing biophilic buildings. It's certainly a city of parks, but it's much beyond that. It's beyond buildings and beyond parks. It's the idea that we, we, uh, we, want, to, we want to live in a city that immerses us in, in nature. It's a city that emphasizes these connections, connections to nature and to each other. It's, an, it's, an, it's a vision that recognizes the importance important role that cities can play in addressing global conservation. We have a, a huge challenge, right? We're, we're in a massive uh, habitat loss around the planet um, and uh, extinction rates going up. Uh, uh, so many species are threatened at the moment. Cities can represent at least a partial response to that. And so our vision of biophilic cities is one where cities share space with many other forms of life, uh, including uh, birds. And that there is a, an ethical duty, if you will, uh, to coexist, to actively coexist uh, with those many other uh, forms of life. So this is a, an image from Singapore. Singapore is one of our original partner cities in our Biophilic Cities uh, network. Uh, it's a wonderful example. It's not a perfect story, but it's a, a city that's done a lot to invest in nature and for many years, it called itself a garden city. Uh, more recently, it's shifted its motto, calls itself, has been calling itself a city in a garden, which seems like a small change, but it's really quite profound. The idea, again, that we don't just have places, uh, a park, a forest, a garden in the city that we visit, but rather we think of the entire city as a forest, as a garden. Um, and, and increasingly, Singapore is using the word nature, city and nature, to describe themselves. And sometimes they say biophilic city and nature, which seems a little uh, redundant that we like that, that idea. This, by the way, is an image of a wonderful building called the Park Royal Hotel, designed by uh, Singapore-based architects Bloha. And uh, it's meant to illustrate some of the things that um, Singapore does. Singapore has something called a landscape replacement policy, so that when you build a new structure like this, you, you have uh, a requirement that you've got to at least replace the nature lost at ground level from the footprint of the building. You have to replace that at least one, one to one uh, with vertical nature. So as you see here, uh, uh, green rooftops and green walls and sky parks and, and, uh, and actually birds are, are, are a part of this as well. I'll come back to that later. So we um, could spend the whole time talking about this vision of what a biophilic city is. Um, these are cities that are immersive, um, immerse us in nature. The nature is integrated, continuous, and seamless, integrating the built and natural environment. It's a whole of, whole of city approach. So from room or rooftop to a region or bioregion and all of the different levels in between. Um, it is a wild city. It's uh, um, a, a an emphasis on wild, bringing wildness and biodiversity into a city. It's a whole of life approach. So we, we, want, uh, we want exposure to nature at a very early age and well through adulthood and, and into elderhood, if you will. It's also just an inclusive uh, a city and it's a city that emphasizes a culture of, of biophilia. So um, we do often say it's a whole of city uh, approach. This is Helsinki on the left. Um, so this idea that you can move from the door of your house 
uh, or your office and, and uh, connect to larger uh, green elements moving from the center of this city all the way out to the edge uh, where you have old growth forest. So again, multi-scale. We sometimes talk about this vision of nature and cities as a matrix of urban nature. There is a sort of an indoor outdoor continuum. We like to say that a biophilic city is one that, that propels us outside. It's an outdoor city, but it also recognizes that we spend a lot of time inside and we wanna bring nature inside as well. And we want to overcome those barriers between the indoor and outdoor uh, worlds. There are so many uh, different kinds of nature that our, our cities um, have created. And, and, and these are just examples. I don't have time to talk about them all, but just to make the point that it's from very small, that backyard garden, that, uh, that green alleyway, um, that, that sidewalk garden, all the way to regional and larger landscape uh, um, level kinds of nature. Uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh is one of our um, partner cities in the network. And here are just some uh, uh, ways that this city sees the nature or thinks about the nature around it. And it's, it is certainly uh, parks, new parks. Um, here's the South Shore Waterfront Park, which is a resilient park that actually allows residents to get down to the water, um, down to the river, but it's also tree canopy. It's it's really thinking about a, a developed city like this image conveys and seeing it in a different way. So looking at that bridge and, and recognizing that that doesn't look very natureful, but it, it could be habitat uh, for a, a peregrine falcon, for example. So on the webpage, uh, there is information about joining, officially joining the network as a city, as a partner city. I can tell you more about that if you're, if you're interested. Um, here's Mayor Peduto, the mayor of Pittsburgh, receiving the membership uh, certificate. And usually there's a celebratory event uh, connected with a city joining. Um, uh, but you can also join the network as an individual. We have several thousand individuals and several hundred organizations. Uh, more of that, again, is on the web page. This is, I think, a mostly up-to-date uh, uh, map showing the partner cities. We have aspirations for growing this um, beyond the 25 or so cities now. Um, and in particular, uh, we hope to have cities in Africa uh, and in China. Uh, we have one city now in Australia, one city in India, um, and uh, several cities in Latin America. But we hope uh, that as this idea gains traction, we'll have more and more cities joining. We also think about a, a, a biophilic city as one that emphasizes awe and, and wonder. And here's another film that you can watch on our webpage about the return of whales to the waters of New York. And there's a nonprofit called Gotham Whale that's raising awareness about this. But we want to live in a city where we might turn the corner and see something that we hadn't seen before or have a connection to, to wildness. Um, and the idea that, for, for example, in New York, you, you might catch a glimpse of a humpback whale or a dolphin as you might be riding a, a ferry. Um, that's a pretty wondrous, pretty amazing idea. And, and the idea that we, that we judge a city by the, by the opportunities to, to experience awe is it, kind of an, a new and important way of thinking about cities. This is another image from Singapore. Um, some of you may know the story of the uh, smooth coated otters that have returned to that, that city state. Uh, in, in large part because of the habitat restoration. The image on the left is Bishan Park and the Kalang River um, that's been converted from a, essentially a flood channel to a meandering biodiverse uh, river. And it's, it's uh, the image you see here is actually a, a, an image of floodwaters. It's doing what it was designed to do and retaining a lot of floodwaters. So there is a a film about the smooth coated otters on our webpage as well. Love for you to see that. So we do, um, David was talking about rewilding and it is very much uh, this idea that we want cities that have wildness and that can take many different forms. This is another film um, and a wonderful story in Perth and Western Australia of converting essentially a, a sterile uh, city center water feature energy intensive chlorinated water feature to uh, this really remarkable native biodiverse wetland in the, in the middle of this city. 
So we have the opportunity to bring more nature into those built in, uh, settings and to rewild a lot of the urban environments where we live. Another example here, David, is a, is a Spanish example, the Torregostez, the capital of the Basque country. And, and they have been uh, a partner city from the beginning as well and famous for their green ring that circles this city. But now this idea of the interior green ring, bringing that nature into the center of the city. And what you see here is a, a stream daylighting, a small river that was underground in a pipe, bringing it back to the surface and creating habitat uh, and creating wonderful spaces for, for human beings as well. Um, I, we, we argue that a biophilic city has to be a just city, a just and fair city and an inclusive city. We know, especially in American cities, there is, we've had this history of systemic racism and, and segregation. And we know that currently today, um, there is a, an unfair distribution of nature. So if you uh, are a person of color, you're, you're, you're likely to be living in a neighborhood that has fewer trees and, and less access to nature. And so um, we're capturing a, a number of the stories that, that cities, things that cities are doing to, to move in the direction of, of becoming more just and inclusive. These are images from a park called Cully Park uh, in the neighborhood of color in Portland, Oregon. We have again a, a, a seven or eight minute film about the story of, of designing a park, not, not designing it from, from the top down by the parks department, but rather giving the neighborhood the power uh, to design this park and, to, um, and, and essentially to own this park. So kids in the neighborhood design the raised bed gardens you see on the images on the lower left. Now, Richmond, Virginia, um, here is a new comprehensive plan in this city which uh, recognizes these historic um, injustices and the need to establish minimum can tree canopy cover and minimum connections to nature in all neighborhoods um, and with a focus with a special emphasis on those neighborhoods of color and those places where the heat, where the uh, heat vulnerability index is very high. These are places that tend not to have very high uh, tree canopy. So um, a huge emphasis on uh, equity. And in Richmond, this is LeVar Stoney, the current mayor of Richmond, who's, who's made an emphasis, given an emphasis to social equity. And uh, a few months ago, uh, unveiled five new parks uh, in that city, especially uh, in underserved uh, neighborhoods. So um, on the web page on biophilicities.org, there are um, pages for each of the partner cities. This is, these are just, just a little bit of a snapshot of what some of the cities are doing. I've already mentioned some of them. Uh, we, we do work on metrics. How do you define what a biophilic city is? How do you measure progress over time? Um, this slide is really meant to say that it's not just the presence or absence of nature itself, but, but the ways that we engage that nature. Do we care about that nature? Do residents uh, are they able to recognize birds, common species of flora and fauna? Do they, uh, are they active in, in, in restoration work in a, in a, in a city? So um, these are other ways to sort of think about what a natureful and biophilic city is. Okay, I'm going pretty fast. I realize now for the sort of the second part, which hopefully builds on the first part, which is this idea of the bird friendly city, which is a really a version of a biophilic city. And here again is the cover of the Island Press book on the right. I'm not quite sure if you're in Europe, how you get this book, um, but it's in bookstores here and on Amazon and all the usual kind of places. But um, we've gotten some good uh, response. And um, on the left is a story in Fast Company about, about the book and about the idea of bird friendly cities. So as I was saying to David, I don't think that I, I don't I know that I deserve to call myself a birder, but I again have had a lifelong love of birds. And for me, they are magical. These are images from a local painter uh, here in Virginia called Cynthia Burke. And uh, we love her, her paintings. And not to anthropomorphize too much, but I love the way her paintings show a different view of especially animals and especially birds. And so the Northern Cardinal on the right, for example, this regal outfit. Um, to me, birds are the closest thing we have to angels on this earth. And they are so 
um, delightful and magical. And, uh, and I, I, I love to start with sort of these, these, these paintings. Also, what you hear. That here in this part of the world, starting in early April, uh, is the that you hear here. And um, when I hear it each, each spring, it takes me immediately back to my childhood. It has uh, it, it keeps me rooted in the place I live. And it's just a magical uh, sound. And so we have, a, again, a lot of that our uh, bird song. Um, so quickly, I've made this point already, but we know uh, um, there's a lot of mental stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression uh, uh, around the pandemic. Uh, we know that pretty remarkable numbers, very daunting numbers. Uh, birds are not the only answer, but they have played, I think, for a lot of us, an unusual uh, uh, an unusually important role in, in uplifting us and giving us a uh, hope. And uh, the image, um, the pie chart on the left is from uh, one of our surveys in the, in the fall, a big 900 person webinar that we did and we, we kind of polled people in real time. And um, I, I was startled by just how important birds, seeing birds, watching birds, going on bird walks, listening to bird song, uh, how important that has been to, to, to so many uh, people. But we know uh, that birds are, uh, are stressed in so many ways. Um, the image on the left is something that may not have gotten as much attention in Europe, but two falls ago, the Cornell Ornithology Lab re uh, released the study that was pretty shocking for many of us that, we, um, that we've witnessed a 30% decline in bird abundance uh, in North America just since 1970. Um, we know globally something like 40% of bird species are in, in, in decline, um, and the threats are, are manifold, right? And they are hugely daunting. It's climate change, it's habitat destruction, it's uh, increasing use of pesticides and, and increasingly you know, toxic, pest, increasing toxicity to those pesticides. It's light pollution. It's all of these things. And I think for a lot of us, um, that, that's so daunting and we don't know what we can do and how we can help birds. But there are a number of threats that, uh, that happen around us, a, a number of dangers that we actually can address where we live and work. And, uh, and thus the idea of a bird friendly city builds on that. Um, so I think a lot of you recognize or know that, uh, that windows uh, are a, a, a big threat for birds. Um, and in the US alone, the numbers suggest that as a, as many as a billion birds each year are killed from bird and building uh, strikes. The birds don't really see uh, windows as barriers. Um, and uh, we have some wonderful stories uh, in the book um, about uh, organizations, citizen-based organizations like FLAP, uh, Fatal Flight Awareness Program is what that stands for. This is a, a nonprofit in Toronto, uh, really the first city I think that started this where they, uh, during peak migration, um, this army of volunteers um, follows a, 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 a regular path around the base of buildings and they uh, collect, they look for injured uh, and dead birds. And, um, and partly this has, is about raising awareness about this threat. And so once a year, a flap actually uh, displays, usually at the, on the Royal Ontario Museum, uh, displays the birds that they collected over the course of the year. And it's, it's uh, depressing, uh, but impactful. And it usually gets a headline in the, in the papers. And so uh, FLAP has done uh, remarkable things and their advocacy has led to uh, Toronto adopting um, minimum bird safe design uh, standards. And so uh, the, the mandatory fritted glass, bird safe glass, um, really the first North American city to, to, to do that. We now uh, are in, in a bit of a positive trend. Uh, San Francisco was the first American city to mandate uh, bird safe uh, glass and bird safe facades. Uh, New York City, uh, probably the largest city, um, is the largest city to have adopted similar standards. They don't come into effect until later this year. Um, but we know this is a very effective way of, of, 
uh, reducing mortality and protecting birds. This is the Jacob Javits Center in New York uh, that was fully retrofitted. Uh, all of the, uh, the kind of conventional glass was replaced with this fritted glass where you've got a, a density pattern. You've got bake, a baked in pattern basically that lets the birds uh, see that glass and understand it as a barrier. And they've seen a reduction in bird mortality from that building more than 90%. And what's interesting is they uh, have also seen a reduction in energy consumption. So as we want to see buildings and cities um, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, their carbon footprints, uh, one way to do it is by making these buildings bird safe and bird friendly. And by the way, they've installed a green rooftop on the, the top of the center as well, which has turned out to be a, a, a nesting site for, um, uh, for birds. Here's a fritting, fritting pattern on the, the lower right. So we have profiled a number of projects um, over the last few months. This is actually another uh, example of a film on our, on our webpage on biofocusease.org. It's also a, a project described in the book. Um, this is an interesting example. This is a, a so-called living building, certified living building. So it's producing as much power as it needs over the course of a year. And it's also, so it's net zero energy. It's also net zero water. It's the kind of building that we need to be building. Um, but a wonderful story of how they retrofitted uh, a, 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 the building to be bird safe. And they worked with high school students actually to use these paracords, these parachute cords that, that are very low cost and they, they uh, drape down from the top of the building and they essentially allow the windows, to allow birds to see that this is a, a window and, a, and, a, um, and it's very, very effective. And as I say, very uh, relatively low cost. So we know what to do. And the trend in, in the US and North America, especially I think is the, the uh, again, making bird, making new buildings bird safe um, and, and lots of examples of that. The Candida building uh, is another living building, a biophilic building on the campus of Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Very, very biophilic use of a lot of wood, but also uh, fritted glass and bird, bird safe. Uh, we can also retrofit existing buildings. This is another building that we've, um, another story we've been telling through film. There's a short five or seven minute film on the webpage about this. It's the Interface Carpet companies, this is their headquarters, international headquarters building. It's a, a 1980s building that's been, been re, you know, reconfigured, retrofitted. And its most dramatic feature is the series of, of glass panels and a, and a polyester sheath in the form of a, a forest, an East Coast US forest. And uh, so it's a biophilic um, element, but it's also, it also makes the facade uh, visible to birds. Um, other examples, the Aqua Tower in Chicago is also described, also discussed in the book. Um, this is an older project, but it's really a, a wonderful story of an architect, Jeannie Gang, uh, who's been committed to designing bird safe buildings. Um, another example would be the Ryerson Student Center. Michael Mazur, the, the founder of FLAP in Toronto, likes to say, that we, when we design things to be bird safe and bird friendly, we, we also have the chance to make architecture more interesting. So, um, and I think he's very, he's right about that. You look at a building like this, which is, uh, it creates a facade uh, that birds can see, um, but also it's really interesting um, visually, architecturally, aesthetically. Um, I did a presentation a few months ago where I had a, um, Bird, birder from South Carolina who said, you know, you're talking a lot about, about big office buildings and high rise buildings and um, you need to talk more about residences. And he's right. When you look at the percentage of, of birds that are killed or injured from, from residences, single family homes, the glass that we have around us in our homes, um, that's a really important area to focus on as well. So um, this is an image from a campaign, Home Safe for Birds. Again, another flap campaign. There's so many things that we can be doing, uh, doing like those um, paracords that would make the spaces around our houses uh, safer for birds. Um, we have good examples of lights out programs, light pollution and lights in cities uh, represent another threat to birds. They disorient, they pull birds in. 
Uh, they make them more vulnerable to building and window strikes. Um, and so we now have more than 30 uh, cities in the US or in North America that have lights, voluntary lights out programs. So particularly at, at, at peak uh, fall and, and spring migration, the building owners turn off the, the lights. So I'm a urban planner. I do believe uh, that we need to incorporate birds into our planning systems and into our plans. These are just some uh, example plans you could, you could pick anywhere. Um, here we have a couple from California, one from Colorado. Um, you'd be hard pressed to find any reference to birds in a typical community plan or comprehensive plan or, or, or general plan as they call them in California. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. And we can incorporate, should incorporate birds. And there are examples of where that has happened. So in the book, I talk a lot about Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And there they have a bird strategy for that city. And they have a standing bird committee um, to guide the city council and the steps, things they can and should be doing to make their city uh, more bird uh, safe. And if you're interested, we can circle back around and talk about any of these. Edmonton, Canada is another uh, city in our Biophilic Cities Network. And here, another wonderful story. It's a city that has emphasized ecological connectivity in its planning. And a lot of this has to do with birds. They've been using this uh, circuitscape modeling uh, based on electric circuit theory, this way, this idea of kind of looking at your city and seeing where there are you know, breaks in those circuits. Uh, what would impede the movement of a chickadee, a uh, black-capped chickadee, as they move through the city. So we've got to be incorporating the perspective of birds in the land use planning, community planning that, that we do. So this is actually a, a, a wonderful example. Here is a, some other images from Edmonton. Um, and so they're thinking not just about birds, but just about every critter that would be moving through the city. And they've constructed now, I think, 27 wildlife passages uh, of various sizes in that city. Um, a lot of stories in the book about places where they've protected large blocks of bird uh, habitat. You see on the right a, a map of the ravine system in Toronto. These are really important movement corridors for birds uh, in that city. And on the left, um, the story of a, uh, an effort to stop a highway in Western Australia. Uh, that, that was going to lead to the destruction of an, an ancient Banksia forest. And uh, Kate Kelly, you see here on the left, was one of the leaders of, of one of the community groups. And it's a, a, a really interesting story. They were ultimately able to stop this highway. And with, they, didn't, they were not able to save all of the forest, but they've saved a lot of it. And it's a really uh, kind of hopeful uh, story. But we've got to to uh, protect the, the large uh, blocks of habitat we have around us and restore as much habitat as we can, plant as many trees as we can uh, in, in and around cities. Uh, one of the uh, stories from that Western Austra Australian case um, has to do with the Aboriginal perspective on, on land and nature. And so we had the chance to interview um, this elder, a Noongar elder, Noongar is the, the Aboriginal a community that 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 lives in Western Australia, and 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 Nanup talks about the the totemic um, aspect of of their culture. And at an early age, children are uh, expected to adopt to choose one or more specific uh, animals, animals or plants to adopt as their totem. Um, for Noel Nanup, it was the bronze winged pigeon, and you learn everything about that species, and then you become the guardian and the voice for that species um, for your life. And so in the book, I make the argument that that's a pretty good uh, tradition that we ought to adopt and that every person ought to adopt one or more totems and, and one or more birds and become learn everything you can about that bird and become um, its guardian and speak for it and, and work on its behalf. Uh, over the course of your for your life. Okay, I'm quickly coming to the end of the time that this, the hour, but um, there are a lot of other ways to think about what a, a bird um, friendly city is. I argue in the book that it's got to be more than the things that you do within the borders of your city. We've got to, we've got to cities have to be 
leaders outside of their borders that, and the, on the regional and the global uh, scene. So we know, you know that um, mig migrating birds move through our city. Maybe we could join with other cities on that migratory path and do things to protect um, larger blocks of habitat um, beyond, again, beyond the boundaries of a city. The image on the left, by the way, here's another image of the same idea, uh, is the east coast of the US. And there's an organization called the Wildlands Network that's, that's uh, published this very provocative map. And they call it the Eastern Wild Way. And the idea here is that we need a vision to protect this larger network of lands outside of cities. And we need to be working to conserve that those lands. They're buffers, they're corridors, they're ecological connections. And, and if you did that in Eastern US, you would, if you did everything on this map, protected everything on this map, uh, a, a number of big pieces are already national parks or national forests, protected land, uh, but you'd set aside about half um, the area for nature. And so this idea of half earth, which is another E.O. Wilson concept that we, that we have the target, the goal, the aspiration of setting half the earth aside for nature, we could actually, cities could be working to, to bring that vision about. Um, so quickly, there are uh, other stories in the book. Um, there is a chapter about Singapore and the wonderful story of the work they've done to uh, restore the hornbills uh, to that city state. Um, really interesting work around um, high tech, smart nesting boxes, and, but also the idea of designing buildings that, are, that accommodate nature, accommodate animals and, and accommodate birds. And, uh, and so a really interesting story of how we reimagine the, the design work we do. And when we, we build a, a, a building or a facility, what you see here is a, a really wonderful hospital in Singapore. And it's, it's the KTPH, um, it's kind of world famous now, but one of the, it has about every green and biophilic element that you can imagine. But one of the things it, it, it does is to judge its own success by how many bird species are seen uh, on the site, on the, in and around the buildings. And there's a, a, a interior courtyard with a waterfall and uh, green window boxes and green rooftops and a city farm on one roof. It's, it's uh, really a wonderful story. But I, I love the idea that we, maybe we judge the metric of a building, uh, the success of a building by, by, by how bird friendly it really is. And other cities in our network are doing similar things. Cura de Bat in Costa Rica. Um, here, a wonderful story in The Guardian about its Sweet City initiative and the mayor who has uh, declared, uh, given citizenship uh, to bees, plants, trees, and, and birds. So I, I'm quickly running out of time, but there's a lot in the book about what we can do uh, with our, our gardens, the gardens, the, the converting the spaces around our homes. This is the story of my colleague Nina Marie Lister in Toronto, who has installed a bird-friendly native garden where there was, you know, where around her, her neighbors have the more conventional lawn. And she bumped up against a uh, Toronto ordinance the, or a bylaw, the, the, the weeds and tall grass bylaw that basically said that what she did was illegal. Um, so we, there are lots of obstacles, but we need to work more on those spaces around our homes. We need to be thinking about the impact of, of uh, domestic and feral cats. There are many things uh, described in the book that we can do, everything from rainbow collars uh, to the idea of, of catios. These are cat patios and closed spaces that allow um, cats to, have, uh, to be outside, but also to protect birds from those cats. So we have a five uh, or seven minute film about Portland's effort around catios. They have uh, something called the catio tour every year, which is a, they, they choose 10 catios. It's like a, a home tour or a garden tour. And uh, it's really wonderful. And this is the organizer of it. It's a collaboration between Portland Audubon and the Feral Cats Coalition of Oregon. A wonderful story of how cats, cat lovers and bird lovers can come together to do things that, that protect um, both birds and cats. And we've got to do more of that. A number of stories uh, in the book, I mentioned the idea of a biophilic city being a city of awe. 
Um, birds are a big part of that. Lots of stories of, of awe-inspiring bird uh, things that happen um, uh, with birds in cities. This is the story of the Vox of Swiss that migrate through the city of Portland um, every year. Hundreds of people come out to watch um, the swirling mass of uh, Swifts as they roost for the evening in this uh, big chimney at uh, one of the elementary schools. It's a wonderful story. Um, quickly, there is a trend I'm saying to my architectural friends, we need to be moving beyond just a glass that's safer for birds to a design ethic that says we can, we can actively accommodate birds. We can create habitat uh, when we design uh, uh, buildings or retrofit existing buildings. And this is the uh, example from London of, a, of, a, of a, newly, a new tower, a new chimney actually that incorporates 54 nesting spaces for common Swifts. And, uh, and actually the wonderful trend in, in the UK of uh, moving in the direction of wildlife friendly development. I think David, you may, may have mentioned that this already, but um, in the book, uh, I profile uh, this project called Kingsbrook um, and uh, it's, it incorporates you know, the use of swift um, bricks and um, the idea that as you buy a house, you might also um, be thinking about birds um, and, and as well as, as um, other kinds of nature as well. But the whole notion of rethinking the, the facades, the, the spaces around the exterior of a building as possible places of habitat. Um, there's even a word now, habitecture. Uh, um, and I highly recommend the work of, of Joyce Wong, uh, who has been designing these facade walls that incorporate not just birds, but insects and bats and other critters uh, as well. Every neighborhood and every city could be organized around birds. This is a story in the book of a neighborhood uh, in New Mexico near Santa Fe where they have, are helping to bring back the juniper titmouse. Um, habitat restoration is a big part of the story as well. These are burrowing owls in, in the center of Phoenix, Arizona. And we have a film about this as well. And there's a chapter in the book about the burrowing owls, this idea of, uh, of installing these uh, artificial underground burrows uh, that replace the lost uh, native burrows that these um, owls used to have. Um, so I'm at the very end, I think. Um, I do think every school could be bird immersive. We need to think a lot more about educating the next generation about birds. And that's partly what a bird-friendly city uh, is. And partly it's about, again, changing the metrics by which we evaluate what a good city is. So this, uh, there's a story from Wellington, New Zealand in the book about this uh, wild area in the middle of, of Wellington called Zealandia, where they've erected predator-proof fences as a way of, of allowing the native birds to, to come back. And, uh, and I love their tagline, which is bringing birdsong back to Wellington. So um, I am frequently saying that um, a city, a good city is a city where every uh, resident in every neighborhood of that city can hear native bird song. And that's not the usual metric by which we judge a, a good city. So there are lots of resources. These are my last few slides. Um, there is an online journal called Biophilic Cities, which has quite a lot about birds. Uh, I mentioned there's the bird uh, friendly page that you can find on the Biophilic Cities page. Um, there are books about Biophilic Cities that we've written, uh, full length films like one called The Nature of Cities, which was playing for a while on PBS here in the US and in uh, books like The Handbook of Biophilic City Planning and Design that's just recently been translated into Chinese. And uh, again, this, um, there's the website, which again has a lot of, a lot of information and material about birds. Um, but we, of course, I'd love for you to find the bird, you know, bird friendly city book. That would be the best um, bit of information for birds. So that's it. I'm going to stop there, David, and uh, stop. Uh, screen sharing. Okay, well, listen, uh, all I can say, Tim, was, or is, should I say, that was awesome, you know, enlight enlightening, uh, positive, and I love the global view. Fantastic. Um, you are right, we have run out of time. So <laughs> we're going to go straight to the question, which is, what is your favorite bird? Yeah, so... Very, very so briefly. 
Yeah, you you got the, a little bit of a, a clue uh, about that um, with the thrush. I, I'm, I'll say two birds. Again, the wood thrush I've already de declared is is a really special uh, bird and a special sound for me. And the other one of the other sounds that I love right now, uh, we've now got the the chimney swifts have have returned, and uh, and the the the, the chatter. Um, again, this is a, a kind of sound experience that I see every evening, every there, you know, in the morning and, and usually when we're walking in the, in, the, in the end of the day. And it's so special to see them do, doing, flying in the ways that they do. It's almost unbelievable. You know, um, that's my, my feeling about so many, so much of the behavior of birds is it's just remarkable and, and kind of, you know, gravity defying and just, um, so that that's probably my second favorite bird. And your other question was, where would I be? You wrote uh, my mind. Yeah, uh, and, and or you warned me that about <laughs> about this. And I, I I think you know the the uh, the answer is that we're just emerging. You know, in this part of the world, uh, as people are getting fully vaccinated now, and we're kind of a little bit of normalcy here. And we're able to be outside, and uh, and so I'm enjoying um, where I am in Central Virginia, and this is my home for um, has been my home for more than 30 years. So I, I think there's, there's no there's no other place I'd rather be living. I would love to be you know uh, with you in Spain. Um, I have special affections for um, parts of of Europe, um, and uh, we usually spend part of every summer in the Netherlands. Uh, I've had some wonderful, uh, we lived part, part for a bit of time in Australia. So I would love to be seeing black cockatoos, you know, and, and Perth and, and in that wild and wonderful kind of place there. So I can't just give you one place, but multiple places, multiple cities. Okay, cool. Um, Zoomers, just to let you know that on Monday the 7th, we've got Charlie Corbett, who's here to talk about 12 birds to save your life. That's Monday, same time, but on the 7th. On the 10th of June, uh, Thursday week, or next Thursday even, uh, Dave Gandhi is going to be talking about birds of Bangkok because he lives there. On Monday, the 14th of June, we've got Tessa Bose, who's talking about Etta Lemon, who is one of the mothers of the RSPB, a woman that was, along with the other ladies that formed the Royal Society for Protection of Birds have been kind of rather forgotten until very recently. Um, and on the 28th of June, we've got Joe Shute, who's a journalist, and he's talking about what do you know about the weather, which is his new book. And also, not up yet, but to be put onto the listing tomorrow, we have the editor of BBC Wildlife magazine, and he'll be talking about how the magazine is put together and telling us all about what it all stands for already. So we're looking forward to that. So, Tim, Inspiring is another word I can add to what you've spoken about today. I want to immediately live in all those places all at once. I think, you know, it's amazing. We'll talk about that more in the Q&A, which you can see if you become a member of the Urban Bird of World membership, which is coming soon, I promise you. Uh, so thank you very much, Tim, last minute, you know, to, to come and talk to us about your wonderful projects and the work you're doing. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And Zoomers, as ever, lovely having you guys here. Um, I hope you've really enjoyed it, as I have. And uh, take care of yourselves. And don't forget to keep looking up. <laughs>